Come here, let's take off your jacket. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get started. Um, again, make sure you're, you're muted. <coughs> I'm gonna set this up as a meeting so that we can have some discussion at the end of, uh, of the end of the, the presentations. Of course, the hazard we're running is that uh, you, you can unmute yourself. So <laughs> please be courteous of that. Uh, I am Will Farmer. I am the acting deputy director in the Northeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. I'm gonna be moderating today with uh, Rick Palmer um, and I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, the session, the workshop that you're part of here is Future of Aquatic Flows. So thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is intended to be a workshop where we hear from several of our panelists and then have a little open discussion about priorities, research priorities, management challenges around the future of aquatic flows. Part of the reason that I'm here and that Rick is here um, is there is a wider effort around future of aquatic flows in the uh, Northeast cask and the, uh, the regional casks at large across the country. And that is recognizing that, you know, aquatic flows are changing over time. And I'll give a little background on that um, as I am in charge of that <laughs> program that's gonna be running nationally. Um, my background is as a research hydrologist. And so I've spent a lot of time looking at uh, understanding changes in hydrology and uh, surface water flows across the country and really across the globe and trying to understand how, the, how water availability is changing. Um, one of the big things that water availability is, well, water availability in itself is an essential part of climate change and uh, water availability for ecosystems as well as humans has become an increasingly more important challenge. And one of the biggest management challenges that we face during climate change is how to understand and prepare for different or changes in the availability of, the availability of water across the landscape, both in stream and aquifers. Um, whether that be extreme events or average conditions, particularly how that, that water is allocated uh, between humans and ecosystems. So this is the sort of grand challenge that we're facing when we think about the future of aquatic flows, how much of that water is available to ecosystems and how do we preserve ecosystem services as a result or by managing for aquatic flows. The program that we're gonna be launching this year, so to speak, um, is intended to bring on nine postdocs across the country to begin to work on both regionally relevant applications of understanding the future of aquatic flows, as well as national synthesis efforts around uh, aquatic flows in general. Um, so this workshop is a way for us to continue to have that discussion about why are the future of aquatic flows relevant to the Northeast region? How does that fit into the context of what we're doing nat nationally? And what are the topics that we should be pursuing when we think about future of aquatic flows and uh, the management relevance of the, that, that subject area? I could go, you know, I'm a hydrologist, as I said, so I could go on and on about the future of aquatic flows, but I'm going to stop here and preserve our time for our speakers. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce each speaker before they give a presentation. Um, they'll give a short 10 minute or so presentation. Please hold all your questions to the end. Uh, as soon as we get, not to uh, minimize the presentation, but as soon as we get through those presentations, we'll have a large chunk of time at the end of this hour and a half for discussion um, between our panelists and with our audience uh, around the future of aquatic flows and any anything that piques your interest in any of the presentations. So be, be sure to write down your questions and uh, share them in the chat if that's more comfortable. And please hold your questions and stay on mute through the presentations. So with that, I will go ahead and introduce Nicole Kane. Um, her work is focused on protecting and advocating for flows in the riverine habitat. And uh, through that, aquatic organisms and through the conditioning of state permits for water withdrawals and hydro hydropower generation, negotiating li uh, license settlements and building, supporting, building and supporting state policy and guidance. Um, I'm gonna let her provide any other introduction she'd like, and I'm gonna leave it to you, Nicole, go ahead. So good afternoon, everyone. I am Nicole Kane. My official job title is in-stream flow biologist, but we often joke in the office that I'm the hydropower biologist because a lot of my work involves hydropower. So I'm starting us off um, just with a quick introduction to how New York State DEC 
has mission That's statements. Um, and we also have uh, division missions because I'm in division of fish and wildlife. And a lot of this focuses around how we're really a public entity working for the public using public resources and compromising as best as we can across all the resources and all the resource uses and interests. So there's a lot of complicated problems that come up when you have mm -hmm. conflicting usages and water is a huge resource that everyone has an interest in. You notice off to the side, I have a division of water technical and operation guidance series. Mm -hmm. This is our TOGS, mm -hmm. what we call 1.3.12 and it's the incorporation of flow related conditions and water withdrawal permits. This began back in 2010. It was a very large discussion talking about all the different ways that we can monitor flows, how we could incorporate flows and water withdrawal permits. And eventually by 2015, we thought we had something pretty well set up, put it out to public comment, took into account as much as we possibly could. And then we finally, moved it forward and in 2017, we developed this guidance document. And you'll notice that we use exceedance values. And that is what we ended up deciding to go with in New York State is we use flow rule curves to account for a seasonal variability throughout the year of very stream sizes. So we came up with um, classifications of streams based partially on size and then based um, also on if there's sensitivity in the streams. And so we have um, higher p-values for streams that we think are able to handle higher withdrawal rates and lower p-values for those that we believe are a little bit more sensitive. So we wanna be more mindful of these potential impacts. And then on top of that, we also broke them off regionally. And we did it regionally because we have, New York State is a rather large state we have influences coming across the, the coastal sea coast from the Atlantic region, but also coming across the West from the plains and then occasionally down from Canada. And so each of these regions with their different mountain regions have different impacts also climate, climatologically. And so we want to keep that into account also. And this has worked fairly well. It's still kind of new, but we find that we usually are fairly adaptive and we haven't had too many difficulties. The most challenging for us has largely been dealing with uh, ski lodges because of the, the winter impacts and the fact that snow, as much as it will release in the spring is still taking away from the streams in the winter. And so that's been, that's been complicated, but we, we usually manage to find a, a pretty good way to move forward largely by encouraging the use of storage. The second that we have as a way to protect flows is our narrative water quality standards. And in 6NYCRR 703.2, we have flow and it's, it's a very simple line. It's very much up for interpretation. Uh, that no alteration that will impair the waters for their best usages. And our three primary best usages are the aesthetics of a waterway, the habitat it provides, and the recreation. And that is on top of any other usages that might be afforded by the public with water withdrawals. But these are the three we generally keep in mind when people are saying, we'd like to use the water for another purpose other than these three. These three have to be preserved. And we do this because this is part of our public doctrine to ensure that these are, are guaranteed. Um, these three, as you've noticed, um, they're all FERC projects, so they're all hydropowers, and they each have their own challenges. So one of them is Saranac, Union Falls. It's on the Saranac River, which is a fairly well-known river in New York. We are doing efforts for landlocked salmon. It flows into the Champlain, and Union Falls is one of the upstream most dams that we have that is a hydropower. It's currently licensed to have minimum bypass flows of 10 CFS across the, uh, the summer and 30 CFS in the spring, mostly because of walleye. But it's also a very big trout stream. And 
again, we use exceedance flows to help guide us to be protective of these rivers. And you'll notice in my lovely little graph that our bypass flows that are currently mandated by the license are exceedingly low. And we have a guidance of saying that we want our bypass flows to be closer to P88. So 88% of the time, these flows should be exceeded. Uh, this is a river that we have our eyes on to do improvements to flow, not just for quantity, but also to making sure that the river is, is flowing without a lot of interruptions to flows. So this one's currently in relicensing. It's a project. It's on my radar. It's one of my pet projects right now. Uh, one that's a little bit more of a success story. This is Christine Falls, um, also in the Adirondacks. It's a fairly small project. It's known to overtop the crest in the winter. So we're not terribly concerned winter flows, but we are concerned in the summer. It's previously been licensed to have 10 CFS from June to February, and then 25 from March to May. And this was back in the 80s when it was licensed. And at the time, walleye was a very huge fishery. So that was why the seasons were declared the way they were to be more optimal to the walleye spawning in the spring. It's really more of a trout water. And we had some discussions with them during our licensing process. And we did a basic bypass reach flow demonstration study. And so we looked at 10 CFS, 25 CFS, 35 and 50. Sort of did a, a very loose Delphi study where we took a look at these flows, had a discussion, graded them. And we negotiated to change not just the timing, but also the flows. So we negotiated for 15 CFS for June to October to preserve uh, relatively good summer flows, but being respective of the fact that this is the Adirondacks in the summer. A lot of these lakes hold their water. They don't really release it. And then 35 CFS from November to May. Uh, this will benefit more any late spawning that might occur, but also to keep any spawning beds completely covered and prevent them from being at risk of ice over. And running into May, which is just about when we start to see really good snow melt coming off the mountains. So by then we should see some good runoff into June. Uh, much to our luck, the applicant decided to agree with us that these are reasonable, that they're reasonable timing, reasonable flow amounts, and they agree to, to up our flows during this time, which is great. We like that. It doesn't always happen that way, but for this little section of river, we managed to get it. And there's also some full fluff <laughs> falls here. So they have uh, also an aesthetic value as well as a, a fishery value. And so this leads us to uh, talking more about climate change and flows. Now, New York State very recently, as of uh, this year, maybe the year before, I think, we developed an office for climate change. And we have a policy set forth by our commissioners that directs DEC staff to integrate climate change considerations into our activities. And this includes developing permit conditions and license negotiations and settlements. Um, New York State is one of the few states in the nation that really strives, at least in hydropower licenses, to push for settlement for every single license or as many as we can get. And that means that we're doing a lot of working together and communicating with our applicants so that we all agree that this is what we want for the license. And there's a lot less headbutting that way. We also have support from NYSERDA, which is Energy Research and Develop Authority. And they've done quite a few studies looking at ways we can incorporate green energy, but also to account for climate change. And that includes looking at what are the prospective climate change concerns we might have. And so a lot of what we've done is we've put in adaptive management plans into our hydropowers, where in our settlements, we set up a five to 10 year period where we can go back, look at our operation schemes, see if we can see any trends changing in the amount of water coming in, and then going ahead and <laughs> making sure that if these are looking like something that could impact their operations, but also impact the environment, uh, make recommendations to then change the operations so that 
they can still operate and we're still being protective. And that's New York State in a nutshell. Perfect. Thank you so much, Nicole, for, for going through that. A couple questions popped up in the chat. So I'll just ask that you take a look at that um, before they get buried, buried in other chats. Um, maybe write them down and, and be prepared to answer them either okay. uh, in the chat or, or when we come back later. Um, let's move on to our next speaker so we can get to that uh, super exciting time when we can all talk. Uh, so next we have Todd Richards, who, let me make sure I get his title right, is the Assistant Director of Fisheries for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, he part participated in uh, a lot of work on in-stream flows in, in the state of Massachusetts, as well um, his interest in, and work focuses on the interaction between fish and wildlife. I'll let Todd add any other biographical information he wants, but um, take it away, Todd. Thanks, Will, and thanks to Rick and Will for organizing this and, and for inviting all of us to participate in this, in this symposium. It's very exciting stuff. So thanks on that. I'm again, I'm Todd Richards, the Assistant Director of Fisheries for Mass Wildlife. So what I do is I supervise a, a small pool of biologists here at the Westboro Fuel Headquarters office, which I'm clearly not in. And, uh, and also uh, uh, supervise one other employee who, who manages all of our hatcheries too. So we have the biological and the hatchery aspects underneath, um, uh, underneath the same umbrella here. And uh, I, when I was a biologist working in quite a bit in in-stream flows, it was a fantastic time, learned a lot. And now thankfully as the assistant director of fisheries, I have uh, great people that help me also do that too. So, and one of them in the audience, Becca Quinones, her name will come up a couple of times as well. She's gonna be working on in-stream flows in Massachusetts and is also coincidentally our climate change specialist. So um, very, very important and germane to the topic that we're going through today. Um, so I'm going to share that. Can you give me a thumbs up, Will? Can you see that? Great. Okay, so thanks again. Um, I work for Mass Wildlife. Mass Wildlife is an organization responsible con for conservation and restoration and management of freshwater fish and wildlife in the Commonwealth, including endangered plants and animals. So we largely handle vertebrate life has been our traditional role but along with the uh, Mass Endangered Species Act responsibilities, we're also able to do quite a bit for rare plants and invertebrates too. So that, that broadens our authority. That's a thing that will come up several times during the presentation too. Uh, Mass Wildlife Restores protects and manages land for wildlife to thrive and for people to enjoy. So you'll see some commonalities between some of the things that Nicole brought up about New York State and some of the things that, that I'll bring up for Mass Wildlife, uh, but there will be quite a bit different as well. It's a very interesting place to try to manage aquatic flows and fish and wildlife resources. Massachusetts is a highly urbanized state. We don't do much on the county level, but we, we do have 351 different towns. Uh, that typically accounts for or uh, accounts for about 1,500 water supply wells and uh, 500 water supply reservoirs. Many of these resources are in the upper ends of the watershed for very clear water quality purposes. But it puts it tends to put a stress on some smaller resource where resources either capturing water or uh, pumping water so the analogy is that there's an awful lot of large straws and small streams which can create a challenge however despite the fact that we are heavily urbanized we have some phenomenal aquatic resources we have some phenomenal terrestrial ones too but this is about aquatic flows so i'll focus on those um, we've identified more than 1,300 trout streams in Massachusetts, and we're working quite a bit on those to create additional products to illustrate not only to anglers, but to the conservation community, how important those are, how sensitive those are, how sensitive they are not only to water withdrawal, but to things like climate change. And we also have a thriving lake and pond fishery. And this is the, the point at which several of the people that I know in the Instream Flow Council would be happy that I remind everyone that, that lake water levels matter too. Right. So we talk a lot about in-stream flow, but the, the changes to lake and pond water levels can be a critical thing to pay attention to as well. Mass wildlife regulations. This is not going to be as an exhaustive list of our regulations. Um, you know, as a 155-year-old uh, organization, uh, traditionally, we were responsible for hunting and fishing regulations. Right? So allowable harvest and establishing seasons. That doesn't give you a whole lot of latitude to determine in-stream flows. 
So the analogy I always use is that um, I can tell you that you can only keep three trout, but I can't tell anyone that they have to keep water in the stream for a fish period, right? We don't have that, that traditional role. And we establish seasons. Again, not a lot of leverage there to be able to, to determine in-stream flows. We have some really good regulations about importation, liberation, and aquaculture, which are great for disease prevention and the prevention of exotic vertebrate species, but they, again, don't really help a lot with, with in-stream flow. However, the Mass Endangered Species Act is, is, uh, is very specific to protecting rare and endangered species and the take thereof and regulating the take thereof and providing mitigation options. And if I go any more into the Endangered Species Act details, I'll get them wrong and then I'll start getting phone calls from folks in our MISA program. So I'll just, I'll leave it at that, but it'll come up again in, in uh, subsequent slides. So there are other regulatory mechanisms that we use. I'm switching over now to something that where we are largely, except for MISA, an advisory, in an advisory capacity and in a research capacity to provide recommendations to better protect fish and wildlife resources through other agencies' regulatory frameworks. We have a Water Management Act, which deals specifically with uh, water withdrawals of a certain level. We participate in policy deliberations about that, revisions to the Water Management Act that highlighted stream flow criteria. Nicole had uh, referenced a couple of examples of stream flow criteria. We did the same thing, looking at watersheds, looking at um, uh, basins and trying to determine alteration levels and then keeping people from, from changing levels of alteration. Water quality standards we've participated in our cold water fishery resource list that 1300 plus streams and rivers is a map you can look up by looking up mass.gov cold water fisheries resources and you can see where all of these resources are and they play into the water quality standards and they play into the water management. The Interbasin Transfer Act is, is designed to keep water local, and we have an advisory capacity in that. And as Nicole mentioned, we are also very actively involved in Federal Energy Regulatory Commission deliberations to try to make sure that stream flow is maintained through those operations and improved greatly over the last, say, 40 or 50 years from uh, getting essentially leakage going over the dam and everything else going to generate power to water in those uh, bypassed reaches to help protect fish and wildlife resources. Some of the limitations or challenges, um, natural variability does not match demand variability. Typically when someone turns on a water supply well, it stays on, right? Uh, it stays on in wet years and it stays on in dry years. And so that natural variability that we're looking for, for frequency, magnitude, duration, timing, and rate of change that sustain these natural resources doesn't match the, the demand that people place on. Uh, we compared to other portions of the country, we primarily water people here in Massachusetts, not crops or livestock. There, there is agriculture and it's great, um, but we have you know more than seven million people that we're trying to keep in water, and so it's a it's a whole different brand of stress, and it comes with a whole different brand of discussion about uh, who needs what, how much water, and how much impact you're going to see. Demand is highest when availability is lowest. That's not uncommon. While we do get roughly the same amount of rainfall uh, each month, um, evapotranspiration accounts for an awful lot of it during the summer, and uh, we do have increases in demand based on summer use that we can tinker with a little bit when we run into drought conditions. And probably the biggest limitations or limitation or challenge is that everyone hates uncertainty. So unless you feel you know 100% that these changes are going to result in restoration actions, nobody wants to partake in reducing water use or changing water use because that uncertainty lingers over them. Uh, it seems to me that if you tell somebody that you have a 10% chance of coming to the wrong conclusion, they'd rather just go out and get a lottery ticket where they have a one in a billion chance of winning. That it, People definitely have a tough time with uncertainty. And we as scientists, I don't think, do a great job illustrating that uncertainty and setting it in context. Uh, data needs. Um, I'd love to see a better understanding of variables that are highly correlated. Each one of them is trying to tell you some kind of signal, but, but they often conflict. Uh, just as an example, impervious cover is implicated in ecosystem decline. That's, that's nothing rocket science. -y. Um, however, in, impervious cover increases in Massachusetts in an east to west gradient. Elevation increases in an east to west gradient. Percent sand and gravel decreases moving east to west. We have more bedrock in the west. We have more sand and gravel in the east. 
how do we tease apart all of these different variables that are so highly correlated so that we can get a better result when we're trying to study, when we're developing models, and we can try to figure out what that signal is telling us. Uh, I just threw one in here basically at the end for goals. Uh, one of my goals has always been to change the mantra from how much water does a river need to how much can you take without having a measurable impact. That is a much better position to be able to argue from. And then, then we can incorporate a lot of other variability concepts and try to try to make sure that we're making the right decisions for fish and wildlife resources. And then, of course, germane to this discussion is incorporating climate change. And as I mentioned earlier, Becca Quinones uh, is our agency climate change specialist, and she's also the current in-stream flow council and FERC specialist as well. So we're well positioned to move forward and, and really start to try to figure out how to incorporate climate change into a lot of these things. It's a daunting task. And so we need to be able to focus on that. And that's all Great for uh, me. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Just really good points in there. Um, so I'm sure we'll get some questions. And again, keep an eye on that chat if there are particular questions relevant uh, relevant to your presentation, we'll come back to them. Uh, let's let's keep moving. Hopefully we have Katie Kennedy's microphone working. <laughs> um, so yeah. yes, we can, perfect. So this uh, Katie Kennedy is an applied river scientist with the Nature Conservancy. Um, she has a wide uh, set of experience across the globe and across the US, looking at creative ways for river management, uh, particularly to provide human benefits, but also to look at how rivers support thriving and functioning ecosystems. Um, so Katie, I'll let you share any other biographical information you'd like, and then um, go for it. We are seeing your screen. Okay, fabulous. Thanks so much, Will, for the introduction. And um, thanks, um, again, to you and to Rick for organizing and, and for the invitation. And this is a favorite topic of mine. So I'm looking forward. I'm already learning a lot. I'm looking forward to learning from my fellow panelists. Um, so as Will said, I'm Katie Kennedy. I'm a river scientist with the Nature Conservancy. I'm based here in Western Massachusetts. Um, like Nicole, most of my flow work has been with hydropower. Um, so I very much have an infrastructure lens when I think about flows. Um, and for those of you not familiar with the Nature Conservancy, we are actually the largest nonprofit conservation organization in the world. So we work in all 50 states, uh, over 70 countries. There's about 3,500 staff, scientists, practitioners, uh, functional staff um, working across the globe on conservation. And we actually turned 70 years this, this year. We were, we, uh, were founded in 1951 and um, primarily as a land conservation organization. So it was only about 20 or 25 years ago that we uh, started working on flows. And I joined the Nature Conservancy in 2012. I came from Auburn University where I did my PhD in river ecology and management and worked on hydro down there. I've been working on hydro up here and um, had the pleasure of working with Rick Palmer um, also on the Connecticut River. So I've been working on that, those five hydropower projects that some of you may be aware of that are that are being relicensed currently. So for any of you who have perused the uh, the literature on environmental flows and aquatic flows, um, have likely come across some literature um, by Brian Richter. So Brian Richter was actually um, responsible for helping to launch the Nature Conservancy's freshwater work um, 20 to 25 years ago. And so um, this is a little bit of a different presentation. I'm, we're not a regulatory agency, so we're a conservation organization. And, and I guess you could say our de decision context is largely support. Um, so so I, I, I myself um, provide a lot of expertise and support for partners um, and influence. So influencing those decision makers that may have um, control over, over policy or over, um, of flow releases or what have you. So, um, so I guess the question that I want to kind of think through with you all today is how the Nature Conservancy is going to be approaching the future of aquatic flows. So, you know, we, we Brian Richter kind of established Nature Conservancy as a leader in, in environmental flow and aquatic flow management and conservation. So where are we looking? Um, what is driving our approach to aquatic flows in the future? And so, 
course, one of these factors is definitely climate change. That's a big, it's, that's coloring all of our work at the Nature Conservancy for very good reason. Um, and no less how we approach um, aquatic flows and aquatic flow conservation. And then secondly, and very much related, is the, this um, emerging and perhaps um, delayed focus on environmental justice. And we have a big initiative at the Nature Conservancy, long overdue, arguably, um, for being more mindful about justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion in our organization, within our organization, and also how we approach and engage with the world. So both of these things color our approach to aquatic flows. And, um, and for me personally, the stakeholder engagement that has been central to my um, involvement in aquatic flows from the very beginning, working on the Tallapoosa River in Alabama, all the way to the Connecticut River, the Ganges River in India, when you're working on aquatic um, management, aquatic flow management, you're working on, on a diverse set of objectives um, and how to think about how achieving those objectives. So um, climate change, uh, climate change is largely responsible for, help, for making us rethink our flow objectives and targets. You know, when Brian Richter wrote his paper, how much water does a river need that, you know, and Todd cited that too. When we were, are thinking about that, largely we think about the, what's, what's happened in the past. We use past data to think about what a river needs today. And that has largely defined how we approach aquatic flows. And many of you are familiar with this phrase, stationarity is dead. That essentially means that using that past data to predict the future is not necessarily the best approach. And similarly, past data is also not necessarily the best protector of aquatic resources, of our aquatic goals. So what then? Um, so we're working on it. One of the things that we're working on internally um, is this freshwater resilience analysis. So we're thinking more about freshwater resilience as our target for, for, for our objective for freshwater. And so we're working hard on defining what this means. What are the characteristics of freshwater resilience? What does a resilient freshwater system look like? And we're working on this large scale analysis. So we're, we're gonna be doing this across all 50 states, all US stream networks, um, characterizing freshwater resilience. And then with the thing that, that I'm really excited about is thinking about looking at how certain actions like dam removal or flow management can help us improve our freshwater resilience. So this is something that we're actively doing, hoping that we have something available for broad consumption um, in, a, in a year or two. Um, and I'm really excited about using this both to help target my work and also to understand how I can improve, um, how we can work toward improving systems to increase climate resilience. The other thing that we're thinking harder about, so this is kind of stepping it down a little bit, is thinking about, well, what, what does a river need? Well, let's think about that rather in terms of deconstructing the flow regime thinking about it more in terms of function. What functions are required to support an ecosystem? And what do those functions look like um, into the future under a changing climate? And this is being um, spearheaded by my colleagues and their partners out in the California chapter in California. So secondly, so the other big piece is environmental justice. So stakeholder engagement, really rethinking the stakeholder engagement and values piece. So this, this idea of values focused management is something that has been central for me. So a big piece of my doctoral work and my work essentially my entire 20 year career has been thinking about stakeholder values and how to ensure we um, incorporate these in a way that meets multiple objectives. So optimizing rather than maximizing and fighting, which is sometimes what we do when we think of what does a river need? We think about, oh, this is what it needs. Now we fight for that. Um, but that's not necessarily sustainable or inclusive. So we're really reconsidering our approach in that way. So when we ask the question of what are our aquatic needs or the aquatic needs, who is our? So being really target, like re really working hard at making sure we're asking who should be at the table, who is affected by this decision, who may not easily be able to get to the table because of a lack of resources and really thinking hard about that upfront. Um, and this idea of 
focusing on values first, so values forward process versus science first and value second is another thing that it's it's subtle, but if you look in the literature, a lot of what we do is think about what the river needs from a science perspective and then bring the values in rather than thinking about what are the values first and how can we use science to support creative solutions to, to meeting multiple objectives, which is a slightly different but important distinction. Um, there's a lot of literature on this. Um, USGS, you're aware of the, of the efforts around structured decision-making in the DOI, um, and that's very much related to this value-focused approach to conservation. And this notion that we can elicit values and judgment in a robust way in, um, that's you know, supported by science for making management decisions, that's, that's becoming more and more prevalent in the literature as well. And not only that, but at the Nature Conservancy, we have a lot of initiatives right now. We have a big diversity, equity, inclusion initiative, a big um, indigenous peoples and local communities initiative. And we have some really great resources. We have our human rights guide. We have um, a strong voices, active choices guide that really helps making, make sure that we're asking the right questions before we enter these um, conversations. So ultimately what this, what this gets to is rethinking flow management and really thinking about this as a holistic approach to management rather than a simple problem. So thinking about the whole system, um, both in terms of people and in terms of our objectives. Um, so one of my favorite books about this is The Honest Broker. So acting as an honest broker, thinking broader about management options, coming to the table, bringing diverse voices, elevating diverse voices, and really, and really broadening the scope of what's possible for achieving, for, for achieving a, a diverse set of objectives. And then again, just thinking more broadly about, about the ecosystem, what are, what are the functions we need to support, thinking broadly about related factors to flow, like sediment temperature and nutrients regimes, which, you know, in, a, in an infrastructure context, those aren't always easily um, approached with our traditional methods of tweaking flows. And then importantly, making sure that we're incorporating and leading and elevating diverse voices as we approach this, this idea of river management and aquatic flow management. So those are my uh, those are my thoughts. Thanks again uh, for having me, and I look forward to um, yeah to having more discussion. Thanks thanks so much. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, Katie. Um, and again, as I said before, just check that chat. Looks like we're getting a lot of questions about definitions around resilience, and uh, so maybe give you a few minutes to prepare a response for that, and we'll come back to it um, in a moment. Thanks again, Katie. Uh, so next we have Sheila Johnson of the U.S. Forest Service. And she is, her experience is around coordinating watershed restoration and management programs across national forest and tall grass prairie units. Um, she has worked with a wide range of stakeholders across uh, different landscapes. And uh, in particular, looking at healthy watersheds in the context of changing climate has been some a sort of central theme of her work. I'm going to let Sheila, I'm going to let you give any more biographical information you'd like. Otherwise, uh, go ahead and get started. And we can see your screen just fine. Great, thank you. Thanks for that introduction. It's a great to be here with such a, a group of people from agencies and organizations I respect so much. Um, uh, so as you know, I am the regional hydrologist with the US Forest Service. Get on the appropriate screen. Um, so, as mentioned today, I'll talk about the intersection of in stream flows, land management decisions, and climate change on national forests of the eastern region. So, if you're wondering where those are, uh, we cover a 20 state region, which is quite diverse, uh, and 15 different units, including the Daywood Nas National Tallgrass Prairie. So within this diverse network of states, in-stream flow questions are addressed within the framework for water rights and uses within the relevant state. Uh, so it's great that we let off with a state presentation today to get a taste of that. There is agency-specific direction regarding in-stream flows uh, in our Forest Service Manual, um, specifically a section on in-stream and standing water requirements, 
which directs us to consider for our national forests um, the in-stream flows needed in three contexts. In the context of adjudications of water rights, um, which may sound like language that you'd hear more often in the Western states dealing with prior appropriation, uh, and certainly looks quite different for us in the East. Another context is in land management planning. Uh, as federal land managers, we need to determine the water needed to meet management objectives for the variety of uses on our national forests. And the third context is in water development projects uh, that take place on or affecting national forests, uh, where we're directed to establish requirements whenever a diversion or an impoundment threatens to alter existing flows or levels, again, tying back to those management objectives. So in practice, this is done in close coordination with the other federal and state agencies uh, and other stakeholders that have a mutual interest in both the aquatic and land management resource needs. And the Forest Service has a long history of considering land and water interactions in the East, both in terms of the effects of land on water and the effects of water on land and living things. The concerns about the long-term impacts of forest clearing and fires on the nation's national resources led to the Weeks Act in 1911. This authorized the creation of the first national forests in the East from lands that were not already in the federal domain. And it's interesting to look back and see a key justification for this authority was protection of headwaters of the navigable streams, an interest in protecting water supplies and um, the river, the the cities that were built up along rivers in, in the East. The 100 years later in 2011, the Forest Service began implementing the watershed condition framework as a comprehensive way to restore watersheds on national forests and grasslands. It's a six, six step cyclical process, guiding assessment of watershed condition, identification of priorities, and then steps to address those priorities. So today I'll talk about how this sets us up to consider in-stream flow, uh, focusing on the first step of watershed condition classification. But to look at it broadly, the classification of watersheds involves both physical and biological indicators and both aquatic and terrestrial components. Those go into a weighted average and ultimately lead to a watershed condition class uh, on a map like what you're seeing here, one of, one of three scales. However, you really need to drill down and look at specific indicators when you get to the action planning and prioritization stage if you want to improve overall condition and sustain aquatic flows. So today I'll just look at a few indicators uh, and how they relate to this objective for aquatic flows and where they point us in the future. So first, uh, water quantity and flow characteristics. Um, this is clearly a pretty direct indicator of the adequacy of aquatic flows. Uh, and you can see that uh, I, I put in a little chart of all the watersheds that overlap national forests in the east, uh, which are largely in good condition, indicating uh, a fairly minimal alteration of flows. However, when we do have restoration needs, they may involve, uh, not surprisingly, hydropower. Um, when, where there are hydropower projects intersecting national forests, we do engage uh, in that, that section 4E under the Federal Power Act, uh, setting terms and conditions with the, for the conservation, protection, and mitigation of damage um, collaboratively with our, our other stakeholders. Uh, it can also involve special use permits for activities like water withdrawals, um, potentially for ski area snowmaking. So some ski areas operate under special use permits, uh, new municipal water supply sources or other water supply sources. And looking at the data we use for these decisions, you know, beyond the, the standard challenges of you know, maybe sparse gauging data and, and obtaining hydrographs for both altered and unaltered situations or understanding biological needs. Uh, we see we need added tools for climate change. Um, 
the recognition of non-stationarity and needing updated flow and precipitation analysis and trying to fit uncertain climate projections into a fixed value that may exist in a permit are some of the challenges we face. And another layer in making land management decisions uh, related to water use is you know, not knowing the, how changes in development or changes in uh, recreational uses will, will affect future needs. So for example, um, clearly the outlook for ski areas could change in the future, uh, and that would have implications for water withdrawals for snowmaking. There are some new tools like a forest to faucets 2.0 analysis uh, that will be launched soon uh, that, is, that are looking at questions like this and how development, climate change, uh, and land use can interact to protect, to identify areas for protection of forests uh, with regard to water supplies. So looking at other aspects of watershed health that are important to aquatic flows, aquatic habitats uh, and specifically aquatic fragmentation are closely linked. Habitat fragmentation is a particular interest because movement of aquatic organisms is critical to the resilience of aquatic ecosystems uh, in light of climate change. So when we discuss fragmentation on forests, this can be related to dams, um, the many road stream crossings we have across the forest, as well as temperature barriers. And some of the tools that we can use to address fragmentation are stream simulation, uh, particularly for road stream crossings, which considers both the high and low flows um, and how that affects the ability of aquatic organisms to pass in, e in either direction through a road crossing, such as a culvert. So as you move across the spectrum of, of uh, stream simulation, you get away from a purely hydraulic design to considering geomorphology, uh, sediment passage, substrate size, um, channel shape and function, and, and um, you know, the reach geomorphology. And this is based on surveys that consider the ability of aquatic organisms to pass at a variety of flows. So there are naturally opportunities to incorporate any updated climate change and modeling in this, in this process. So in the future, you know, a common sense step that, that can be taken at any time is to update our design guidance, moving away from that 25 year flood planning uh, which is certainly proved inadequate to less frequent, uh, less frequent floods, um, such as hundred year floods, which we know are coming much more often uh, than, the, than past data would suggest. Uh, moving up the stream simulation spectrum, I think you see a little dip in the road service acknowledging that even with floodplain uh, relief culverts, at some point this, this crossing may overtop and we need to think about how something will fail and what are the implications to minimize the damage. And some of the uncertainty we still face is how sediment, wood, ice, um, and even channels themselves will move and relocate during extreme events. Um, and moving along, but continuing on the road theme, um, we get into the terrestrial side and, and where are land management decisions can be affecting aquatic flows uh, and where we have room to change for the better. So the road and trail networks on national forests are, are often legacy infrastructure that may have been in place for decades. Uh, some of it may have developed from a deer path that formed years ago and became a hiking trail. Factors like increased imperviousness, ability of roads, ditches, and trails to capture flow, uh, an interception of floodplain flows by roads that are trails that are close to water uh, all have potential to impact aquatic flows. But some of the tools that we brought on board are BMP effectiveness monitoring that can address the road drainage issue. Uh, while certainly best management practices aren't limited to roads, um, this is one way to understand where infrastructure impacts are occurring by evaluating uh, either sediment or flow impacts and, and knowing where improvement is needed. And then particularly for low volume roads and trails, we can assess the need and location uh, of infrastructure with each project that we evaluate 
and with each flood event that occurs. So I believe this was a road at one point, uh, and as it washes out, we have a chance to think about, is this sustainable as a road? Being a national forest um, with some lower use roads, we may have that option to say, this is something that isn't sustainable in its current form and we can restore the floodplain uh, to better accommodate the high flows that we're seeing. So again, uh, similar to, to my earlier point, changes in seasonality of use and the fact we're seeing increased use on this infrastructure um, kind of has an interplay with what we can consider as an option. And then understanding how different seasons will affect the infrastructure itself, such as frozen crossings um, that we may rely on for snowmobile trails or for uh, winter only roads used uh, in forest management um, or areas that, that may not be fully understood. And to end, I wanted to um, end on a positive note about forest cover. They're not, not surprisingly, across the national forests of the East, you know, a good forest cover condition is over 95% of a watershed currently in forest cover or regenerating uh, as needed to establish forest. And that describes the vast majority of our watersheds. Um, so tools like the climate adaptation workbook, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, the value in that for understanding how to maintain healthy functioning forests. Uh, and, and that tool is actually adding more considerations for forested watersheds. But this is a good point to remember that um, the forest cover both on and off federal lands in the East is a key asset to maintaining and moderating in stream flows um, and protecting forested areas, looking at whole watersheds, and maintaining recharge areas are key strategies in the future of aquatic flows, um, often with no regrets or multi-benefit solutions that we can pursue. So, um, you know, I think we're, we're in a pretty good place in the East, certainly on our national forests, um, but even looking beyond that boundary. And in some cases, we just want to stay that way. Thanks. Great, thank you so much, Sheila. Um, and again, just to check that chat and make note if there are questions directed at, at you, it's really, really interesting to, to hear how you brought sort of quality and habitat into the, the weighting matrix there. So um, we may revisit, revisit that a little bit. Um, for now, let's go to our next speaker, uh, Richard Palmer, who is the founding university director of the Northeast Cask at UMass. Um, and he's now a professor emeritus. I like to say he's retired in quotations because he seems to be doing an awful lot of work for retirement. Um, but his work has focused mostly on seasonal availability and changes in the availability of water um, and its impacts on all sorts of things. So I'm gonna let him give any more introduction he'd like to give. Otherwise, jump into your slides, which we are seeing just fine. Great, thank you. Um, and Will, hearing me just fine? Good. Okay. Uh, well, first, let me just say how impressed I am by the previous speakers. Um, everyone's been perfectly on time and done just a terrific job. Uh, so I really appreciate that. I always like to start with this figure, this painting, one of the early American landscapes, which shows a very um, pastoral view of a river, uh, of a river basin with some ominous things coming uh, from the left and sort of our theme today. Um, let's see. Um, today, what I want to talk about a little bit is what will happen to our hydrologic extremes and sort of the way they may or may not impact aquatic habitat and health. And, and I want to say again, it's been a real pleasure to listen to the other speakers. Um, there's really nothing that replaces uh, experience. Um, and so it was great to have today uh, state people, federal people, NGO representation for the for the talks, uh, and they they bring sort of the the rubber meeting the road experience is extremely valuable, and the work they do is also extremely valuable. Um, um, we heard about it today. They're very busy helping uh, all of us uh, have a. Uh, sort of uh, more pleasant, beautiful, healthy environment in the future. Um, and we also heard about, I think, particularly in the last talk about how when we think about 
in stream flows and protecting our, our habitats, the need to integrate information really from a whole variety of sources, whether it's from fishery biologists or, or hydrologists or the general public. And we've heard a lot about power industry companies. And so uh, all these things have to be have to be weighted and brought into a decision-making context. And the first piece of bad news I have is that their job is really only going to get much harder in the future. Uh, so keep keep at it. Um, this has been mentioned, and, and I will cover a little bit about climate change. With, with all the other challenges that our speakers face, uh, they now really must consider the impacts of climate change on both our normal flow conditions and extremes. And just real quickly, I want to say um, this is not news, right? This is not this is not breaking news. This is an old 2006 cover of Time magazine. Um, but climate change impacts weren't discovered in 2006. Really, the science of climate change goes back a couple hundred years. This this understanding that the the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide levels and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere has an impact on our temperature is very old. Um, serious concerns go back to the 1920s with intense industrialization and before that. And I, some of you may have read and understood that early computer models, early computer uh, models of the atmosphere go all the way back to the 50s and the 60s. So this is, this is not new information. Um, this paper was mentioned before uh, and I'll just highlight it again, stationarity is dead. This is paper is, was put together by really a series of USGS uh, researchers, uh, in addition to some academics uh, and, a, and a NOAA uh, employee. And uh, I like what Todd said, that I circled this little thing that says, an uncertain future challenges water planners. And I think that fits right in right into Todd's comment earlier. And we've been thinking about this and we're all of us, I think, are trying to come up with ways where we can deal with uh, our changes and making our environment more resilient to these changes. And for those interested, you might check back to some previous webinars and workshops that we've done on thinking about slowing the flow uh, for helping in climate resiliency. Um, just real quickly, I'm going to talk about some work we've done at the NECASC, um, and I particularly want to give you some, uh, what should I say, cocktail type information that you might be able to use the next time someone tells you that they don't believe in climate change. The, the way that we try to estimate hydrologic extremes uh, in the future is to start off with outputs from uh, global circulation models. I'm going to show you some results that took 14 of the probably 36 most uh, commonly used models. All that data is at a fairly coarse scale. It has to be downscaled so that it can be useful for our models. Uh, moving around this little uh, counterclockwise clock, you've got to pick out the basins that you want to look at, maybe build a hydrology model of that basin, take those outputs from the climate models and the downscaling process, put them into your model, generate stream flows, and then go and use that to try to either extrapolate high flows or low flows. And the other thing I want you to think about is that every you wait four or five years and then you rinse and repeat. That is to say, every four or five years, we get a new set of updated climate models and that's typically when we start this whole process again. So although we could discuss every single step of this uh, in detail, what I really wanna do is spend a couple of minutes talking about the broad general re uh, results. So this is a very complicated picture or table. I'm gonna help you focus on two things. Uh, the In the blue is precipitation uh, at, at the top and in the orange is temperature. Um, I have put highlights on the right-hand side of the uh, representative concentration uh, futures for 8.5, and so I'm going to I'm going to kind of mark out 4.5 and suggest that the path we're on right now is a climate future associated with 8.5. And so what I want you to focus on is that in the precipitation changes that we anticipate; these are the averages of 14 models. We see winter precipitation, and this happens to be for the state of Massachusetts, growing by almost 24% uh, by the far term period of 2060 to 2090. Um, and then 
below in the temperature, we see a remarkable uh, 4.52 centigrade or eight degree uh, centigrade increase in temperatures in the winter. And one of my colleagues at the Northeast CAS um, used to say, um, you'll be able to tell your grandchildren when there used to snow in, in Massachusetts. Uh, that's a kind of a overstatement, but the, these figures indicate very large changes. So focusing on precipitation, we see a lot of increase in precipitation in the future uh, in the winter and not so much in the summer. Um, and so because it's gonna be warmer as indicated in the lower part of the chart, uh, and it's not going to rain a whole lot more. Evapotranspir transpiration is going to take a lot of that moisture out of our out of our system. So, translating this precipitation and temperature data into um, to to runoff, we want to take a look at that. But but for your cocktail conversation, what I would suggest you for you to say is that by the 2060 uh, 2100 time period, the impacts will be twice as great as by 2050. Uh, that's sort of the, the, an easy number for you to remember, and it's fairly accurate. Okay, so what we did was we looked at 86 uh, uh, watersheds within the state of Massachusetts. Uh, they range in watershed ranges of uh, square miles from very small to much larger. And we looked at the impacts of climate change uh, for those two time periods that I, I was mentioning going forward. And the basic punchline is you would expect, and as other people have suggested, is that our hydrologic extremes would be more extreme. So I'm going to show you two graphs real quickly here. Um, and again, I'm going to focus you on the lower left graph, uh, which is the uh, representative concentration uh, uh, in the future projection at 8.5. And what you see in that graph is a plot of 100-year floods that are 80 uh, seven sites, and anywhere you see a very dark blue, we're predicting a more than 30% increase in the 100-year flood. And that's more than 30%. Uh, some of them go up to 40 or so. The light blue is 15 to 30. Uh, that very light blue, 5 to 15. And there are some, the greens represent areas that we don't see a large change. Uh, and uh, even there's a few light yellows in that group where we actually see an increase, uh, a decrease in the 100-year the flood. So um, next, what I want to show you is the seven-day 10-year low flows, the same sort of figure. And again, for the moment right now, focus on the lower left-hand side. And what you see there are changes in the seven-day 10-year low flows, and we're looking at the late summer. And this figure, the previous figure was for the winter. What we're seeing is the late summer, early fall being really the most uh, dramatic period, uh, although summer can be very strong too. But what's happened is the rivers have fairly much dried up. The precipitation isn't as great, and we're seeing a longer time to recovery uh, for spring, for late fall uh, flows. So everywhere you see a very dark uh, gray dot, uh, we're seeing uh, changes in seven day 10 year low flows by more than 30%. Okay, um, I kind of summarized that in what I just said, but basically in the winter, we have increased precipitation and higher uh, extreme flows in the summer. We have some increasing high flows in the summer, which I didn't show you, uh, and it's basically because a little bit more rain in the early part of the summer. In the late summer and fall, we're seeing these seven day 10 year low flows decrease dramatically. Um, and I've cited here at the very bottom, this paper that came out last year that does a nice job of summarizing all the research there that I was uh, presenting. Um, I wanted to, just to return for just a moment, moment to something that Will mentioned, uh, the, the entire USGS CAS network is uh, kicking off a postdoc program relative to the future of aquatic flows. Um, it's made a lot of progress and we're really excited about that. It already has nine regional proposals that have been developed and vetted, submitted and reviewed. Um, we anticipate those will be funded by September of 2022. Uh, our goal is to build this cohort of climate science and adaptation, adaptation researchers throughout the Northeast um, and across the nation through this program. And uh, we really hope that the people who are here today who are interested 
uh, will become involved with that. And they can do that certainly by talking to Will uh, or by talking to me. Um, uh, we'd love to hear your interest in the program. So Will, I'm gonna, oh, I also wanna know we have a couple of products that are coming out already from that process. I wanna thank you. This is a great shot of our campus at UMass Amherst. And before getting off, I just want to, I don't know, one more picture uh, that I wanted to show before I stopped. Um, so I'll leave it at that, Will. Awesome. Thank you, Rich. Uh, yeah, so um, thank you all for sticking with us. I know it's getting late out there in the East, so really appreciate you joining us and appreciate all the panelists um, and, the dis and hopefully appreciate your participation in discussion now. I will sort of seed discussion with, with a couple questions. Um, and my first one is gonna go to both Todd and Katie. Um, Todd, you, you referenced uh, a sort of approach to future of floods, or sorry, future of aquatic flows in terms of determining a measurable impact. And you cited a paper that Katie brought up as well which is the Brian Richter piece on how much does a river need? So I wanna invite, uh, we'll start with you, Todd, just give a, a quick blurb on um, why you think the miserable impacts is a better way to approach that problem. And then maybe Katie just have the, the foil ready to say why you, why you, from your perspective, it might be better to go with a, how much does the river need? Um, feel free to agree, don't, don't have to disagree, but, but we'll start with you, Todd. <laughs> So uh, from, from my perspective, it just, it's, it's easier to demonstrate that you've changed something significantly than it is to say, okay, what's left is enough, right? So if, you, it's, if you're arguing from the, the, the top down, it's, it's a, it, it seems to be an, an easier sell to say, look, see, you changed it, as opposed to the, what we were typically running into is, well, there's still fish in there, what's the problem, right? So by illustrating that measurable change, we were able to move the needle and move the discussion to what seemed like a more productive uh, uh, direction. It's, there's, there's nothing wrong with the statement about, about how much water does a river need. It's just, <clears throat> just a different way of looking at it. Yeah, Katie, what's... Any response or, or additional thoughts? Um, so I had a conversation with a colleague, uh, Julie Zimmerman, who uh, you all may also recognize from uh, the aquatic flow literature about this. And I think that our, from our perspective, things have changed. Our understanding has changed. And I would more agree with Todd. And when you know both of us think that how much water does a river need? Well, technically it needs every single bit of it. <laughs> and so, the, the question is, what are the consequences of making changes and at what point are, is that a, are those consequences a problem? So it's all about actions and consequences and trade-offs and trying to understand, you know, what is, what is the trade-off of that action between this, this use and that use and then looking across the board and figuring it out. I think the how much does a river, water does a river need is, is um, you know was appropriate for the time. I think we've learned a lot about stakeholder engagement and values, and um, and and science um, that the frame is changing a little um, more aligned with what Todd said. Great, thanks. Um, I'll come back to you, Katie, in a moment to talk about the freshwater resilience, just to give you a heads up. But before then, um, Nicole and Sheila, I want to bounce a question off of you. Um, in a lot of work with, with water availability, we talk about availability as an intersection of quantity and quality. And both of you talk about um, in-stream flow requirements, largely in a quantity perspective. And Sheila, you brought some of the quality aspects into it as well. Um, so I guess I, my question is sort of a, a soft question of, you know, how do you bring quality into the future of aquatic flows? Is, is it purely about quantity? Um, what are the elements of quality that might be important for the future of aquatic flows? As well as when you talk about uh, aquatic flows, you know, the, the availability question of who is the water for, right? Is it for certain species, for a subset of species or, or what have you? So just sort of talking to expanding the scope of, of future of aquatic flows in terms of quality and quantity. And Nicole, uh, Nicole, we'll go to you first. 
Okay. So I actually Steve asked this question a little bit earlier about um, protection of habitat and uh, biota. So when we look at quantity, quantity is, is actually very closely linked to the quality of the habitat. Uh, if you don't have the water, you don't have the habitat. If you don't have the habitat, you don't have the biota. So we're looking for the maximum minimum, if, if, it's a, if that makes any sense, the maximum minimum amount we need to have the activated habitat needed for targeted species. And those targeted species can be important sport fishes, or it could be sensitive species like freshwater mussels or threatened dragonflies and damselflies. And so that, that's usually what we're looking at when we're trying to determine what our flows should be is what is the best quality water we can get for the minimum amount so we can balance all these, these uses that are coming together because it's really difficult to tell an applicant, no, you just cannot do this without having a very good reason. So when we put in our recommendations for this is how much we have to see, if they disagree with us, the impetus is then on them to say why that's burdensome. So we, we do the best we can to say that this is what we need to be pro adequately protective to provide best usages for recreational use as well as habitat and still allow you to operate and generate power or run your golf course or wash your gravel. Yeah, Sheila, any other thoughts? Yeah, so yeah, in so many cases, uh, water quality and quantity are inextricably linked. I think, you know, if you look at the low end of the spectrum where you may end up with uh, dissolved oxygen concerns or, um, you know, where you may see low flows or low water levels leading to algal blooms where people have never experienced them before. Um, you know, in some of my Great Lakes work, that's becoming a concern. Um, and then at the high flow end, you know, certainly uh, issues with sediment and nutrients can come into play more so when you see changing flows on that high end and when you haven't adequately uh, managed them or managed your land and riparian areas to accommodate those high flows, um, you see the water quality impacts as a result. And, and I'm, I'll just add something really quick here. Uh, this happens a lot with hydropowers and bypass reaches that don't get adequate flows. You go from extreme low flows to when you have floods come through, extreme high flows. And there's no median. The river is not allowed to all, adjust at all. It, it has such a disconnect between maximum, uh, maximum flows and absolute minimum flows. And it's the, the river just can't be a river at that point. You, you have nothing there except for these constant extremes. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Thanks for that insight. Um, I, in a moment, I'm going to ask you, Katie, to speak about the freshwater resilience uh, definition. But just to give Todd you a heads up, I'm going to come back to you. I want to hear more about uncertainty communication after we hear from Katie. And I'm sure the other panelists will want to <laughs> talk about that as well. Though Todd is, is uncertain whether you know, he's going to talk about it. Um, Katie, why don't you give us a primer on freshwater resilience and, and functional flows and how the, how the TNC is thinking about that? Sure. Um, well, this is the nice thing about being at my computer because I can pull up the definition, right? Here. So we're uh, defining freshwater resilience both from the site aspect and the system aspect. So for the site res resilience, um, we're looking at a network that has, I'm going to read this definition to you, that has the enabling conditions to maintain diversity and ecological function, even as the system changes in composition and structure in response to changes in climate. And then for the system resilience, um, the network has the composition structure and processes needed to sustain diversity. Um, and then, so I think that's, that's the general. And then in terms of what um, what they're looking at in terms, I think that was the other question was definition. Um, let's see, they specifically um, connectivity, so connected networks. Uh, they, they're looking at physical factors like length, complexity, temperature variation, topographic gradients, and access to groundwater. And then for condition characteristics, um, floodplain connectedness, watershed intactness, hydrologic alteration, or lack thereof, 
and um, water supply, and then um, and then biodiversity. So those are the factors that they're taking into account. And I will also mention that they're working on the Mississippi right now, and they will come to the Northeast, and there is a plan to have a panel of experts. So there may be some of you on the phone, on the call that will be tapped for that. I think they may be behind for maybe obvious reasons, um, but, but it sounds like, yeah, that will be coming within the next year, I expect. Um, cool. Did that cover it? Yeah, thanks for sharing that. And I'm sure yeah. there are questions others will, will follow up. Uh, so, so Todd, you've had a minute to prepare. <laughs> Tell us all about how we deal with communicating uncertainty in our uh, setting of flow regulations or, or what have you. And um, certainly others, feel free to jump in if, if, uh, if something you hear sparks you. Go ahead, Todd. Yeah, so um, in, I used that time wisely to figure out how to divert everyone away from the concept of uncertainty so I could, like, instead ask Katie other questions or do something. <laughs> Um, Katie, we need the aquatic resiliency thing to be done last year for a specific product that we're doing in Massachusetts. So if you could do that time machine thing, that'd be great. Um, the un uncertainty stuff, you, you try to provide context when you can. Trying to get people past the idea of uncertainty is really tough because scientists hate uncertainty and they're deathly afraid of it and they want to run screaming if there's any of it. And they always want to doubt themselves because that's what we're supposed to do and we're trained to do. We are, we are very poor salespeople and and any time that you can benefit from from working with someone who does a better job communicating with humans i would take that opportunity to do it and and learn from that too because because you know um, one of the tactics that i use is, is to try to illustrate to people that that not only am i somebody who's supposed to protect natural resources but i am also a user of the resource they want to protect which is the water supply for example just just as an example right i have to turn the tap on too i i have to pay my water bill too and so i'm not going to do something that's going to keep me from turning on the tap or that's going to cost me a hundred times as much in my water bill so I, I can relate in that sense the opposite is not necessarily true there's a lot of people that are involved in water supply or or industry or that don't that don't spend any time understanding the value of fish and wildlife resources and the value of keeping that water in streams so if you can relate to them a little better that that might help but that's just the tip of the iceberg is some kind of idea on how to better relate the concepts of uncertainty to people and um and and just to try to give them context it's just so uneasy it, and it's hard to get And often they just don't like the answer, so it doesn't matter what you tell them, they're going to just disagree with you anyway. Great. Awesome, Todd. Thanks for that. Um, any others want to, of the panel want to comment on, on how we communicate uncertainty or how we incorporate uncertainty into our uh, flow development or flow, flow assessments? Cool. Well, I see yeah, I'll, I'll, well, I'll take a shot at it if it's okay. Yeah, go for and it. And uh, Todd, I, I re really appreciate your comments. And, and I think there's a couple of things I would say about that. I, um, in a, a, a number of years ago, we were generating streamflow forecasts for, for a water utility, a uh, hydropower facility. And we would generate, you were using forecasts from the National Weather Service. And at the time there were 22 different forecasts that they ran their models for, and we would put them in their decision making and they would only focus on the median of those forecasts you know they they very, had a very exactly what you said they had a very hard time uh, viewing as a probability and let me just say i think that the whole our whole professional life is spent taking things that are uncertain and making them a certainty like the seven day 10 year old 10 year low flow that's an exact number or the 100 year flood that's an exact number and i can only encourage all of us uh to do what you sort of said be around people who can communicate uncertainty and embrace it because we do not know what the 100 year flood is and we didn't know what it was 50 years ago or 75 years and we won't know what it will be 25 years from now it's a probability distribution so um keep working to help people understand that these are reoccurring events they uh they're they there are there are no precise values and that they need to think about all of this in sort of a risk framework 
that and 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 try to recognize that uh, these are natural processes and you can make your best guess and you need to decide if I'm 15% too high or 15% too low, what does that mean in terms of it damages? Uh, so yeah, find people who embrace it. That's what I would say. Yeah, I would say we're fairly brave in New York. When we have questions like this, we actually just upfront say, we don't have all the information right now. This is the information that is currently in front of us. And we're going to do the best we can with what we have now. And 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, maybe 50 years when these licenses come back up for relicensing and evaluation, we'll have even better knowledge. We'll have even better records. And we'll be able to make even better uh, decisions and recommendations at that time. Uh, avoiding the fact that there is uncertainty and that we don't have all the information at the time really just sort of pushes the cart down the road for someone else to deal with. So just upfront saying, this is what we have. This is the decision we're going to make based on what we have now. Get us more information. Well, we might have something better. Yeah, for sure. Um, as we as we close out the session in the next 10 minutes here, I want to um, invite our panelists. I'll start with you, Nicole. Um, there were a lot of questions asked during each of your presentations. So if there's one or two of those that you want to address from the chat, um, please take a moment to do that. Why don't you go ahead first, Nicole? Sure. So I'll start with Rich's question first, because that one's real easy. Uh, he asked how many staff we have dedicated in New York State to in-stream flows. I'm one of two. <laughs> We do have a lot of assistance from our regional staff with fisheries, uh, division of water, mainly with water withdrawals, and then our permit staff helps us with condition and permits, but mainly for water withdrawal concerns and hydropower concerns with flows, it's me and uh, someone we just hired this early winter. So <laughs> there's not a lot of us. We work very quickly. Um, See, I think uh, uh, I might mispronounce this, but Rewa asked about what bypass flows are. Bypass flows are the flows that go through reaches of river that have been bypassed because water was withdrawn from one point upstream and then is discharged downstream. Uh, the easiest way to imagine this is uh, hydropowers have penstocks that divert the water around to their turbines. That stretch of river is a bypass reach. And without us mandating flows, those reaches are conceivably completely dewatered with the exception of when uh, water flows over the crests. So in order to keep those sections of river productive uh, to continue uh, protecting the habitat and the biota that might be there, we mandate that there's an amount of flow that needs to be passed at a regular amount through regular seasonal variations so that we can still have those river flows, those river sections. They're not lost, they're not dead. And with luck, we have them be as naturally occurring as we possibly can get while also allowing the hydropower to work. So a run of river functions such that there's a minimum amount or inflow. If they hit the R inflow, they're not operating, but the river is constantly flowing. It gets more complicated when you get into storage-based uh, productions because uh, they really require the water in order to operate and a lot of the times they require it because they're demand facilities. They're basically the backbone of green energy when everyone else isn't able to operate. They are. So they, they argue with us the most about, <laughs> about allowing water to pass um, and they're the ones we do the most adaptive management plans with. So and then that brings me to Allison, who asked about what a Delphi study is in terms of flows. Um, I talked about how we really need to collaborate and work with settlements and discussions to get us to all agree. A Delphi study is all about collaboration. So we build a study, we decide what kind of information we need, what we're going to evaluate based on a panel. We usually demonstrate flows. Um, a really robust one will have multiple transacts with multiple data, and we'll look at things like how much flow, how much habitat will we need in order to have all the life stages of um, 
an important sport fish, an important bait fish, and then usually a non-sport species, and then a macro invertebrate of some kind. Um, the really simple ones, we're just looking at the, the flow and using our expert knowledge, and then we're grading what we think of these flows. Uh, whereas if it's very robust, we're using the data and also our observations and then making our, our grading off of those flows at those times. In the end, we discuss our grades, why we just graded them the way we did, come to an agreement on the grades across the entire panel, and then we make a recommendation that we can all agree upon so that there's no later disagreement when we get to the stage of writing up our license conditions. We've already agreed upon them. And, and that's a Delphi. It's very different from an IFIM, uh, an incremental flow method. That's completely data-based. And then you make recommendations on the data. Um, a Delphi is more about coming to an agreement with some data included. And I think that's all my questions. Cool, Sheila, I'm gonna jump to you. Any other thoughts you have you wanna share or questions in the chat that, that piqued your interest? Well, I will mention, I shared a couple links in the chat to the main page for watershed condition framework. Um, there is a lot more to it, uh, especially on the, the management planning side, which I think is really exciting. Um, and the interactive map viewer is a great way to zoom into a place you're interested in and learn more about condition, as well as priorities and action plans. Um, yeah, thanks for sharing that. Rick had a great and challenging question about uh, the weighting of watershed condition framework indicators. And, you know, while I, I can't dig into the record enough to answer specifically why 30%, 10%, I will say, you know, it's generally weighted toward those, those indicators most directly connected to the water. There is a terrestrial condition assessment that's sort of a complement to the watershed condition framework. And that looks more closely at the terrestrial ecology side. So that's why really it's the terrestrial biological indicator that is weighted a little bit less than those, um, the physical and the aquatic physical and biological indicators. I'm sure a lot of interesting conversations could be had on how different ways to reconfigure that, but it is a scorecard approach and not like a process-based model with an ecological outcome. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm looking at the clock and, and feeling like maybe I need to give Katie and Todd a pass, <laughs> but um, I don't want to lose everybody. At first, I want to just thank the panel uh, and say I really appreciate y'all being here and the audience uh, being here as well. I put a link in the chat for NECASC uh, priorities if you're interested in opining on that. And again, feel free to reach out to, to Rick or I if, if there's something in the future of aquatic flows that um, you think is interesting or, or you want to chat about, even if you just want to chat about the topic, feel free to reach out to us anytime. Um, so I think, uh, Katie, I'll just give you a, a minute or so to, to say a last word if you like, and I'll do the same for Todd and Rick as well. Sure, I just put a, a message in the chat to address Rick's question for identifying relevant stakeholders. Team Z Human Rights Guide is a great resource. Um, and just thanks for, for being here. This was super fun and um, a really great topic. I'm looking forward to hopefully engaging with several of you in the future. Awesome. Thanks, Kitty. Todd, any any last uh, impressive words for us? Not, not necessarily impressive, <laughs> but uh, following on a couple of things that everyone has said, I think it's important to use the partnerships available to you because there aren't a lot of us doing this. So if everybody can benefit from everyone else's experience and expertise, then we're going to get a lot further. Um, uh, in addressing these these issues of in-stream flow and in particular now uh, uh, approaching the climate change aspect of it. Sure. And Rick, bring us home. Sure. Um, again, uh, our thanks to everyone who tuned in to this session. Uh, I know it's a long day um, and we appreciate you hanging around. Uh, second, um, I want to uh, thank again all the speakers and, and they just did a terrific job. Um, and I guess three and four is reminder that tomorrow there's another full day. I hope all of you can participate on any of the sessions that you find interesting. And in the long term, key stay in touch um, with Will and myself about the future of aquatic flows national project that USGS is funding. Again, we'll, we'll be engaging nine 
uh, postdocs, one specifically for the Northeast. Uh, and if you have ideas and if you have some priorities that we should be looking at, uh, please let us know. It's a two-year program. Uh, lots, lots of great work will be done. Great. Thanks, Rick. Um, I guess we'll let you go for the evening, everybody. Thanks so much for being a part of this and look forward to seeing you again tomorrow morning.